So, Department of Labor has certified our application. We went over that in video three of the series, the 2024 to 2025 H-2B Visa Ultimate Guide. Video two, we went over the prevailing wage. Video one, we did kind of a summary. We talked about the timeline of what we're actually doing. So now we're talking about the USCIS and of all the things that have changed since we first started doing the series in 2018, USCIS step has changed the most. Now, I've been drinking tea this whole time. It's been a prop. It's been a bit, you know, we made the tea, we uh, poured the tea, we held the tea. Let me tell you something. Meet me at the same camera. What, what does John Stewart say? He say, meet me on camera one. 2021, 2022, I did this video with Trent Williams. If you watch that series, we were drinking wine the whole time because we were both parents of very young children at that time. And this was our one chance to get together and drink, you know, make something fun, do a video. The video got progressively darker over the course of the day because we were filming into the night. I was rosy cheeked by video seven, even keeled here on video four because I'm drinking tea. Okay, I'm lying. I'm drinking tea, but I'm also drinking coffee. See this? Coffee. I was gonna say the tea helps me stay calmer, but it's the tea and the coffee that keep me up. But I'll tell you what I'm not drinking, alcohol. Do you know why? Because I have high cholesterol. I'm approaching my 40s. I've been doing law for 10 years. I'm not depressed, but I don't want to be. That's why I'm drinking tea. Too much information? Maybe, but I'll tell you what's not too much information. The rest of this video where I do talk to you about the USCIS process, as I mentioned, unlike me, it has changed a lot in three years. The USCIS has in fact made things harder. They didn't switch to tea from alcohol. They switched to fire whiskey from water when it comes to their prices and how they're calculated, resulting in the most needlessly convoluted and complex pricing structure in all of immigration. How to pay for the H-2B visa, uh, you know, certification with USCIS. Here's what happened. Uh, after a years uh, long process, the USCIS decided that all I-129 filers, meaning employers filing for employees, uh, would now be filing, uh, would not be paying additional fees. For the H-2B program, where we were already paying $150 mandatory H-2B fraud fee, so money meant to, you know, investigate fraud in the H-2B program, we are now also paying, like all I-129 filers, uh, an asylum fee to help with the processing of asylum applications uh, of people coming to the country looking for asylum. Now, the politics of the asylum program aside, however you feel about it. I have complex feelings on it. You can check out our podcast, 10 Billion People, where I go into it. But no matter how I feel about it, I'll tell you this. I don't think employers should be paying for the asylum program. You've got, uh, you've got uh, employers that are trying to bring in legal workers, and they're being told, you're going to fit the bill uh, for folks that are coming to the country through an unrelated program and uh, through a system that uh, is bringing a lot of folks uh, who aren't going through this kind of regular process into the country. That's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of employers and it's just a weird place to end up, especially because that fee is $300 or $600 per application depending on who you are, all right? So here's the fee structure. The first thing you need to know to calculate your fee structure, okay, when filing your I-129 application is, are you a big employer or are you a little employer or are you a non-profit? If you're a big employer and not a nonprofit, then you're going to either be paying a fee for named employees or unnamed employees. Named beneficiaries or unnamed. If you're paying for named beneficiaries and you're a big employer, it's a $1,080 base fee. For unnamed beneficiaries, it's a $580 base fee, both of which are an increase from the base fee of $460 before April 1st, 2024. Then you're gonna pay the mandatory H2B fraud fee, which is still $150, no matter the category. And if you're a big employer, you're then gonna pay $600 on top of that for the mandatory asylum processing fee, which doesn't concern your workers, okay? It concerns asylum seekers. And then if you want premium processing, which you'll end up in the processing your application in 15 days, as opposed to 60, it's gonna be an additional $1,685. If you think you're gonna be doing premium processing, and you're a big employer, that's going to be $3,015 per petition. Uh, if that sounds complicated, let's keep going. Let's say you're a uh, big employer and you want to do named employees. Well, then it's $3,515 per petition. 
but you can only put up to 25 named employees on that petition. If you have more, even 26, you have to file a second petition and pay the same fee. So that means if you have 20, if you have 30 workers, your total costs are going to be 3,515 times two, which is $7,030 for 30 workers. Does this disincentivize you from having between 25 and let's say 35 workers? Absolutely. That's a huge cost to pay that you have to be aware of. But let's say you're a small employer. That sounds better, right? Instead of paying a $1,080 uh, base fee, again, look at this chart, you're paying a $580 base fee. Okay, let's assume, assume you're a private, you know, small employer, meaning you have 25 or fewer employees. Um, you then pay a $300 asylum fee, 150 mandatory fraud fee, but premium processing is still 1685. Okay, in this case, you're gonna come out ahead, but here's the rub. You have to prove that you're a small employer. How do you prove that you're a small employer? Well, you have to show proof USCIS recommends showing tax filings that you haven't employed uh, more than 25 people in the previous year. Well, what if you're a sole prop? How do you do it then? I don't know. There's not enough guidance, but what we're doing is putting in letters from the sole proprietor saying, look, I'm not employing anybody. This is my situation. What this means is that if you want to show that you're a small employer to pay the smaller fee, you have a burden to present extra evidence. The crazy thing is, if you're a small employer and you want to skip that whole step of like demonstrating that you're a small employer, you still can't just pay the big employer fee to get, you know, past that part of the process for some strange reason. Okay. Let's say you're a nonprofit though, or let's say you're a small employer pay, paying, uh, filing for named beneficiaries. Then it's still, you know, it's a, I think it's, it's still, it's still this base fee at the top. I forget off the top of my head. And you still have to show that, you know, you don't employ that many people. If you're a nonprofit, well, then it becomes really complicated because no matter what, you have to show that you're a nonprofit, you have to show proof of that, and you have to show how many people you employ. So all of this adds to the administrative burden of this program that for some reason decided to take what was working fine, which was a program streamlined by the registration process at the DOL side, and make it into something that's torturous, uncertain, and just odd. This I-129 form, um, Everything now goes to the Texas Service Center. And that was done, that started in this year in 2023, 2024. It used to go to California and Vermont. Everything now goes through Texas. And it was supposed to make things faster, but Texas is getting receipts out slower, okay? And it's most of the time forwarding things to California and Vermont anyway, re uh, resulting in delays. For my money at the USCIS step, going the regular processing route is uh, just not a great option. You can't, contact the USCIS by anything other than snail mail if you go the regular route, so not if you don't pay the 1685. Whereas you get access to a fax, yes, I said a fax, and email support if you're going the premium processing route, and you get to know if the USCIS has actually accepted your petitions because they'll send you emails. If you don't do premium processing, you don't get to know any of that. The Evidence that you have to present on the USCIS application is a little different than a Department of Labor application. Typically, a well-reasoned cover letter that states your need, the basis of your needs, seasonal or peak load, should be enough as long as it covers all elements. If you say you're going to provide evidence in that cover letter, then you better provide it. If you don't say that you're going to provide evidence, then if the statement of need is good enough, that's going to be good enough for the USCIS. Of course, now, with the payment exceptions, if you're a small employer, you do have to provide evidence of that. I would like to tell you that um, everything goes smoothly, but it doesn't. USCIS is now, especially Texas Service Center, is in 2024 routinely rejecting applications they should accept because on your application you're supposed to put, are they unnamed workers? Are they named workers? Are you a big employer? Are you a small employer? Are you getting Northern Triangle workers, workers from named country, are you getting returning workers? Are you getting new workers? Are you getting workers for April 1st, May 15th, May 1st, January 1st, October 1st? All this is information that you have to put in, and the USCIS sorters, these people who are often new, often not trained very well, um, are getting confused and rejecting applications. So if you get a rejected application, send it back in with whatever clarifications you, you need to make. What I like to do on my USCIS application cover sheets is put in red writing who this is for. Is it for new workers, returning workers, workers from a specified country? What's the starting date is? Whether this is cap exempt or not, and then I like to list all of my checks and attachments on that cover sheet as well, okay?
If you want more information, the 2024-2025 H2B Visa Guide, which is in the carousel below this video or in the links, shows you what a cover letter should look like and what should be included in the typical application. You'll also see the latest pricing guides there, okay? If you have questions, frontiertech.com slash consultations. You can do a consultation with me. Um, I am have, you know, it starts with a free consultation. If you want something longer, it will be a paid consultation. Uh, but you can go there. But again, if you download the guide and watch all the videos, you should have a pretty good idea. So is the USCIS step straightforward? It should be, but the USCIS just keeps on shooting itself in the foot in 2024, 2025. I think it's going to prove to be a very frustrating year for everybody on this score. So that's it, right? That's it. So, But once you file it, what happens? Well, once you file it, if the USCIS accepts it and it's approved, you finally get your H2B visa and that's when you go to consular processing, which is what we're going to talk about in the last and final video of this series. Okay, so cheers. Thanks for sticking me with this long and let's go to the next thing.